there is one important consequence of the <laughs> Petrovite theorem which I forgot to mention last time and uh, Sudarshan drew my attention to it. I want to mention it. That is the first thing I want to mention. I made various statements which all together form the Petrovite theorem so to speak. But one more statement which is needed is the following. This says that every irreducible representation of a compact group on a Banach space is finite dimension. What do I mean by this? First of all, representation of G, a compact group G on a Banach space means the following. This is a mapping of G into they are called row into bounded operators. on the Banach space B such that rho G1 G2 equals rho G1 composed with rho G2 the Banach space. It is a each of these is bounded operator <coughs> uh, for every G1 G2 G and secondly, and the map G cross B to B given by G B going to row G B is continuous. See, the point is that. In the space of bounded operators, there are several topologies. There is the norm topology for one. One does not demand that this be continuous in the norm topology. There is a weaker topology known as strong topology, which means pointwise convergence on B. So, in that topology, that top, in the, it is in that topology that we want continuity. So, this is continuous, the, that means from G cross B to B, this mapping is continuous, same thing as saying on what is called strong topology on the bounded operators. If you put that, then this mapping is continuous. See, uh, if you look at, for instance, you have this, uh, take the case L2G and we have the left regular representation. That is action, action of G by left translation, representation is the representation in this sense. If you L2G, you can put the operator topology on operators on L2G. In that topology, the mapping is not continuous. For instance, in the case when G, <coughs> in general, that ma ma mapping is not continuous. So that is why one has to formulate it a little differently. Even this, even such a nice representation will not be continuous if you put, put the to, to operator norm here as the topology. <coughs> so that is the reason why this is true. And of course, irreducibility means there is no closed G invariant subspace in the Banach space. Irreducible means that there is no non zero proper subspace. of B stable under all of rho G. So, and then with this definitions, the statement is that every irreducible representation of a compact group on a Banach space is necessarily finite dimensional. 
And the proof roughly goes like this. So you take a representation rho g to the boundary operators on the Banach space. And then I will now define a map from B into <coughs> L2 of G, which is compatible with the action of G by R rho on B and the left regular representation here. And how does one do that? You take for this fix an element alpha in the dual of the Banach space. And to each b in b assign the function uh, <coughs> yeah g going to for g, sorry cons consider the function on g given by G going to rho G B alpha. Rho G B is in the Banach space. I apply the linear form on that. This gives a scalar function G. I am looking at a complex Banach space. I should have said that. <coughs> so G going to rho G B alpha, it is easy to check. So let me call this map phi alpha. It is a simple exercise to see that phi alpha of uh, <coughs> rho g of any b is L g of phi alpha. So the action of g on both sides, so this, this gives me gives you a mapping of b into L 2 g and what I am saying here is that this is compatible. The, this map is compared to the action of the group on the two sides here by the left translation and here by the representation via the representation rho. So you have in other words you have got a mapping of B into L2 G and this mapping is non-zero because I am assuming that if alpha is not zero phi alpha is not the zero map. So once it is not zero it, Phi alpha, phi alpha is easy to see is continuous. It is a continuous map of B into L2 of G. Now, if the representation is irreducible, the kernel of phi alpha has to be 0. I mean, phi alpha is not 0. If alpha is not 0, phi alpha is not going to be 0 not going to be 0 and therefore kernel of phi alpha has to be 0 which means it is injective. So it becomes in other words B becomes a G stable subspace of L2 of G and it is also assumed to be irreducible. Now last time I should told you that L2 G decomposes an orthogonal direct sum of finite dimensional irreducible representations. So B has to map if you project to one of these finite dimensional representations B has to map isomorphically onto it. So suitable one because B is irreducible, the sub module, so sub representation and then you project into some factor, some projection to some factor must be non-zero. Take such a, such a projection that is again a G mod, the, the projections are all G mod, <coughs> are all compatible with the action of G. So you get a mapping, if you this phi, phi alpha, compose phi alpha with projection orthogonal projection onto a suitable irreducible representation. Compose that then what you get is necessarily an isomorphism of B onto a finite dimensional irreducible module because all the sub, so irreducible sub modules occurring in L2G are finite dimensional. L2G is an orthogonal direction of finite dimensional irreducible representations. So this is a important fact that you have <coughs> any irreducible representation is necessarily finite dimensional for a compact group. Okay. So now let me get back to 
where I was at the end of the lecture, I was talking about the definition of a Lie group. First, I had defined an analytic manifold <coughs> I defined an analytic manifold is a <coughs> topological manifold. M together with an equivalence class of analytic atlas. Remember, an atlas was defined as it's a collection. UIFI of coordinate charts and analytic <coughs> analytic atlas. Coordinate charts on M such that FI composed of FJ inverse. No, remember that FI is a mapping of UI onto an open set omega i in Rn, fixed n, <coughs> such that Fi of inverse is analytic on Fj of ui to the new j for every ij that is what an analytic atlas is. <coughs> This immediately enables us to define the notion of analytic function on a analytic manifold. Two atlases are, are said to be equivalent if you together they form an analytic atlas. In other words, you have, you have Fi is one atlas, say Vi, Gj, Vj, Gj is another atlas. You want Fi inverse Gj and Gj inverse Fi both to be analytic maps. And then the two together will form an atlas. And in fact, therefore, you can take all equivalent atlases and take their complete union completely. That will be a maximal at analytic atlas for the given. So the maximal, if you can define it as that with a maximal analytic atlas. It makes no difference. All, all this, of course, there is uh, always this logical difficulty of talking about all. But that can be overcome fairly easily because you can assume that the UI is self-indexed. That is, there is only one, each open set. Uh, the two, two, two different eyes correspond to two different open sets. So this will be a collection of subsets of this and the Fi are maps of the such subsets into Rn. So it's a set, there's no problem. And you can do it for all the atlases and then the union again will be that. So that gets over whatever logical difficulties you may have. <coughs> okay, so the, this is the definition of analytic manifold and you define a function, R valued function on <coughs> an open set. Let me give it a name F U omega or U R on an open set u of m to be analytic if f composed with fi inverse which is a mapping of fi of u i intersection u into R is analytic for every I. This is a good consistent definition because if it so happens that if you have a point, if, if you have point x in u intersection ui as well as u intersection uj, take a smaller open set there, 
something is analytic in that open set only if this is after composing this is analytic and analyticity is a local property <laughs> therefore it doesn't matter what open neighborhood you choose so <coughs> so this is and this is well, well defined and it will depend only on it, you can do it with respect to just one atlas any other equivalent atlas because of the compositions being analytic the po point is compositions of analytic maps are analytic analytic and composition of analytic functions, analytic functions, analytic. So this is a definition of analytic function, and a vector valued function, u to R n. If you have f, this is a essentially an antipolar function, f one of t f n. You call this analytic. Is analytic if every f i is analytic. That is the definition of analytic vector valued analytic functions. The reason I want to go into to make this definition is that this is what will enable you to define analytic functions between two manifolds. If you have M and N are two analytic manifolds, and if you have a map So, yum and then are analytic manifolds. And suppose a map. Phi from u to n, u open in M <coughs> is analytic, it's a definition. If for every <coughs> j in j, you look at the composition of g j composed with f on Uh, phi inverse v j intersection u. This function makes sense on this phi inverse v j intersection u. <coughs> phi, yeah, yes, because f is a function which is defined on this, on u and therefore on this and that, that takes it into v j. So, g j composed with f on this set on is analytic that is the definition. Everywhere you convert things into functions on open sets in Euclidean space by composing with f i or f i inverse. <coughs> so, a map is this therefore, you can now talk of analytic maps between between manifolds and it is it is immediate if phi m to n and psi n to p are analytic maps of analytic manifolds then so is psi composed with phi. Of course, you could replace m by an open set in m and if it maps into a certain open set you can also replace n by that open set here and then the composite is analytic. The point is always remember that analyticity is a local property. A function is analytic if and if it is analytic in the neighborhood of every one of the points on which the function is defined. F is analytic on an open set U if it is analytic in the neighborhood of every point in that open set. <coughs> so, that is an important fact that it is a local property. Okay, now, <coughs> there are uh, two important theorems. Uh, about analytic manifolds which are actually immediate consequences of corresponding theorems on Euclidean space which I will now proceed to state. The first uh, for the statement of the first 
one should define the notion. Suppose M is an analytic manifold. And suppose P is a point in M, a tangent vector to M at P is a map V from functions, analytic functions defined R valued analytic functions defined in a neighborhood of P unspecified neighborhood from this space into set of all real valued analytic functions defined in some neighborhood of P into R satisfying the following condition. V of lambda f plus mu g both f lambda mu in R and f g are functions of this kind. Func f is defined in some open neighborhood of the point p, g is defined in some, the neighborhood need not be the same. But lambda f plus mu g is by definition lambda v f plus mu v g. That is function is linear over f, you can multiply and you can add these functions and you can multiply these functions by scalars, this family and so it makes sense to talk of lambda f plus mu g and that is equal to lambda v f plus mu v g. Secondly, v of f times g, f is a function defined in some neighborhood, g is a function defined in another neighborhood, f to g is defined not on the, so it may not, it may not be defined on the neighborhood of, uh, on which f or g are defined, but it's in the intersection f, f g is going to be defined. The same thing is true of lambda f plus mu g. This is equal to v f g of p plus f into f p to v of g. That is, it is like differentiation, I am, this is Leibniz formula for differentiation. Applying this vector v, uh, applying this uh, element v, by a tangent vector v on the function is like differentiation. In fact, if you look at in R n, the you have the tangent vectors d by dxi, f going to d by dxi of f at a point p. Look at this map, it obviously satisfies these two conditions. And so it is a, a tangent vector at p. Basically what one says is this, you see you have in R, Suppose you take a curve for instance like this and take a tangent to this curve. You can take a function f restricted to this curve and differentiate it along the curve. That if you take two curves which touch, which have the same tangent vector, then you can see that differentiating along this curve at this point or along the other curve at the same point gives you the same, uh, same uh, result which, which shows that what you understand geometrically as a tangent vector is really a collection of curves all of which are touching each other, okay. And it is in that sense, you know, the tangent vector here in a, in, a, in a manifold, you can take a point and take a coordinate chart there and then you can look at curves in the, lying in there which is essentially curves in Euclidean space. And you identify two curves if they touch each other in the corresponding Euclidean space. So, and then you get certainly a differentiation like this. 
In other words, even this d by dx i f at p can be transported into tangent vectors at the point p in the manifold m. You start with the manifold m and take a point p and fix a chart in the atlas u f if we fix a chart. The tangent vector here is same thing as going over here and finding a tangent vector to the corresponding point, point corresponding to p in f u. Okay. In other words, this d by dx i once you fix a chart this d by dx i at a point p can be considered as tangent vectors to m itself. And the also suppose you have suppose the both the functions f and g vanish at the, at the point p then this vanishes as well. So in other words products of two functions which vanish at that point vanish the, the tangent vector applied to that vanishes. In other words V actually defines a map of uh, <coughs> all functions defined in the neighborhood etc. defined in etc. modulo functions of the form fg fg vanishing at p all functions defined in the neighborhood and take all these functions vanish there you find that in, so if it is a product of 2 then it vanishes. So you take any combination of products of this kind. So see the, this means I am looking at uh, combinations of such product products. <coughs> Therefore what you find is let me let me make a more precise definition. I look at I will define the notion of a germ of an analytic function. Actually germs of any function can be defined, germ of any function can be defined, defined, defined as follows. So you take at a point P in a, these are <coughs> I look at pairs U F U neighborhood of P F analytic at P. I look at I call this F is this collection of pairs U F F is an analytic function at P, an analytic function on P, on U. On this f I introduce an equivalence relation namely u f is equal to v g if f equals g then in the neighborhood of P contained in U intersection P. I mean unless it is contained in the neighborhood I cannot talk of F being equal to G the neighborhood. So there is some neighborhood in which F and G coincide then I say they are equivalent. So locally equal functions are sorry? Locally equal functions are declared equivalent. Locally equivalent means what I mean they are equal in the neighborhood so they are they are the same germ. I mean, the function is an element of f, and then I am going to define the germ. I introduce this equivalent relation, and f modulo the equivalent relation is this space of germs of analytic functions. It is a vector space because if you add two functions f1, f2, <laughs> the germ of f1 plus f2 depends only on the germ of f1 and germ of f2 and does not depend on the particular f1 and f2 because you can always cut down the neighborhood to something smaller then you find that. So this space of germs analytic functions is actually a vector space is more is actually an algebra over r because the addition of pairs of like this 
gives rise to an addition in f multiplication gives rise to multiplication in f so a multiplication by scalars also makes sense so this becomes a ring it's an algebra r algebra and this algebra is isomorphic to r xn which is the ring of or algebra of convergent power series so r why because an analytic function has a Taylor expansion around any point I will go to Euclidean space and there it has a Taylor expansion the Taylor expansion gives you a convergent power series. So I have associated to the function f the convergent power series. Conversely, given a convergent power series, it defines an analytic function in the neighborhood of that point. The Taylor series defines gives the function back. So you find that this is uh, this algebra is same as this algebra of convergent power series. And then, if you have convergent power series, the power, it's in the form a alpha. So f convergent power series. means let me f equal to sigma f alpha x power alpha, alpha where alpha is a multi index of uh, non negative integers and x is a multi variable x1 x2 xn this means x power alpha means x1 power alpha 1 etc xn power alpha n and one knows if it is a convergent power series this implies sigma f alpha x power alpha defines it defines an analytic function. I should write, let me write x minus x naught power alpha, where x naught is a point in Rn. It defines an analytic function in a neighborhood of x naught. So that tells you that the mapping from f model of the equivalence relation that is from the sp space of germs of analytic functions to this is on to because any such power convergent power series defines a function and it is also one to one because the Taylor series determines the function. Okay. <coughs> so all this tells you that and now once you have all this you find that the tangent space let us look at what a tangent vector what does it do a tangent vector is actually a mapping of f modulo the equivalence relation which is into r and satisfies v of g lambda f plus mu g lambda v of plus mu g mu v g and v of f g f g 0 g p plus I should really since I am working at a point p I should probably put a p here g plus f p into v g. <coughs> so, a tangent vector defines such a such a map we know that. On the other hand, if you look at V now fix a coordinate chart U U F with P in U. This first of all enables you to identify and let, let us also assume that f of p is 0 for simplicity which you can because you can always translate and make sure f of p is 0 <coughs> composed with translation. So, fix a coordinate chart u f then get isomorphism of f p with k with r con this is a notation of convergent power series 
in n variables. You have an identification of these two. And now, if you take a function f, no, let's see what happens if uh, if f is constant. Then I claim that Vf is zero because you take f equal to constant say one, g also to be one, v one into one will be equal to v one into g one plus f f one into g one. But f and g are taken to be the same, so you find that it is twice Vf, and therefore it has to be zero. So f is constant, Vf is zero, and secondly. Let us look at let V of xi. Now xi, I am thinking of this as a function, is, is, as one of these variables, which is essentially the function xi, the coordinate function xi on Rn. What is V of xi? <coughs> Suppose let V xi be equal to V is a <coughs> V x i is say uh, a i with some scalar r right. Now let us see what happens to V of x i is a in r and <coughs> then look at that consider the tangent vector. Ai d by dxi at zero in Euclidean space, which is can be transported to something in P. So, if I look at this, I claim Vi consider V is actually equal to I am taking some sigma Ai d by dxi, V equals sigma Ai d by dxi. I claim that this. At, at 0, v equals this. Why? Because apply it on any function, any function ex, expand the power series. So, on constant is 0. So, you can take you look at only those power series which constant term is 0, which means you will get some sigma fi xi plus higher order terms. Every higher order terms, if you apply v, it is going to become 0 because v of fg is 0 whenever f and g both vanish at a point. If I look at xi xj, it is going to vanish. If any term you look at that, it is going to vanish. You can, you can write the power series as constant term plus linear terms sigma fi xi plus terms in which there are always products which are, you can write the rest of it as a, a sigma xi times some phi i where phi i also vanishes. And once you do that, you find that you apply these on both sides, you get the same same value which means that V is same as sigma A d by dxi on all convergent power series. So in other words every tangent vector is a linear combination of these special tangent vectors. These tangent vectors are got from the coordinate chart. Use the coordinate chart. In the coordinate chart you have d by dxi and transport them using the chart into a tangent vector in the manifold at the point P. So at any point P you have Every time vector is a linear combination of this kind, sigma i d by dxi. So d by dxi at zero itself is a tangent vector at, at the point P. So this I will also write this as d by dxi at zero using the coordinate chart at zero is same as I will give this some matter of notation. I'll simply write this d by dxi at P as well. You have fixed the chart, then P goes to zero. Uh, that's the assumption. So d by dxi at zero is I am going to write that as d by dxi at p. It depends on the coordinate chart. A coordinate chart immediately gives you certain tangent vectors and every tangent vector is a linear combination with real coefficients of that tangent vector. And I also claim that d by dxi are linearly independent. As see the, the, Suppose you have a d by dxi to be 0. <coughs> the, I want to say a d by dxi or the d by dxi are linear independent because you look at d by dxi evaluate on xj 
then what you get you get the Kronecker delta delta ij d by dx f j is delta ij. So it is clear that they have to be linearly independent because and therefore we find that in other words the set of tangent vectors form a vector space of dimension exactly equal to the dimension of the manifold. Set of tangent vectors at P form vector space T P m I call it of dimension n moreover if u f is a coordinate chart the chart in the atlas for m then if you look at d by dx i at p f p is some point in Euclidean space and d by dx i at that point instead of 0 I do not have to assume that f p is 0 I just said d by dx i at that point. So, d by dx at p 1 less than 2 i less than 3 n is a basis of <coughs> t p that is why it is of dimension n. If you choose a different chart you get a different set of different basis if you y1 y2 yn are the coordinates in one chart x1 x2 xn the other coordinate then you know the yi can be expressed as functions to the xi and then you have the formula for differentiation uh, after change of variable d by dxi will be sigma dy dyj by dxi into d by dxi that is that, the kind of thing that happens okay. So uh, now let us look at suppose m to n more generally you can take an open set in m and suppose f is an analytic capital F is an analytic map fix a point p in m and let f p be equal to q. Now if you take a function in the neighborhood of q compose with f and you get a function in the neighborhood of p and suppose you are given a tangent vector at p then I can apply v to this composed function. So, you find v is in tpm look at v of f composed with f where f is analytic at f is analytic at q you compose with f you get analytic function in the neighborhood of p and v of that makes sense and it is easy to check as f varies this gives a tangent vector at q we, we have f composed if you take g composed with f and f composed with f times g composed with f you take the product that is nothing but we have f composed with f and a g of that evaluate that point plus etc and therefore what you get is a tangent vector you get a tangent vector corresponding to every point so get a tangent vector to n at q in other words you got a mapping of t which i call i'll call it df the function i called f right yeah df at p is a mapping from tp to tq this is the this is called the tangent map or differential of f introduced to the point
d of p is the differential of f at p. With this definition, we have the following theorem, just a restatement of the familiar inverse function theorem. Suppose f m to n is an analytic map and p in m is such that d f at p from t p m to t f f p of n is an isomorphism. Then there exists an open neighborhood U of P in M such that F restricted to U is 1, 1 f of u is open f of u equal to v is open in n and f inverse from v to u is analytic. This is nothing but the standard inverse function theorem x because the whole problem is clearly local and you can take u to be some neighborhood in which there is a chart available u f and you can assume that f of u is also contained in some chart because the mapping is continuous. So you do that then what is it? It is a mapping of open set nuclear in space to open set nuclear in space and what is this d f? This linear map is nothing the matrix of this linear map with respect to the basis d by d x 1 d by d x n and d y d t d by dy one etc on the other side is nothing but the Jacobian matrix. So Jacobian is non-singular means this mapping d of p is an isomorphism. So it is just a reformulation in an invariant way of the inverse function theorem. And you also have a correspondingly the so called implicit function theorem which I am not going to state. I will leave it to you as an exercise to state the theorem in the case of manifolds. formulate implicit function theorem. The theorem is usually formulated as a function from an open set in Rm plus n into Rm and then you have the condition that some minor of the Jacobian matrix is not equal to is of, is of uh, is non singular. Here you have to formulate it a little more carefully you have the you have a mapping of a m plus n dimensional manifold into an m dimensional manifold and you have then the map df and you have to assume that df at a certain point p q is subjective and use that and reformulate that is that is the way to do it. <coughs> this is an important term which will be frequently used in many contexts also in the context of Lie groups because Lie groups themselves are analytic manifolds in which such that the group structure, group multiplication is analytic. So let me, so it will, this is one theorem which you want. The second theorem is the theorem of existence of uh, solutions of uh, ordinary differential equations, existence uniqueness. Well, I will not, uh, what I will do is, no, the existence theorem, uh, okay. For ordinary differential equations. A parameterless family.
family. The theorem stated like this. Suppose f is an analytic function. on <coughs> an interval a b cross u cross omega u open in R m omega open in some R m. This omega will be a parameter you will get a family of differential equations parameters by this set omega that is what I am on. Suppose f is an relative function so f is from a b cross u cross omega to r. And let uh, uh, u uh, may be used, let me call it i from omega to u be any analytic function. and t not in a b be any point. Then there exists an analytic function g from t not then there exists uh, epsilon greater than 0 and analytic function t naught minus epsilon to t naught plus epsilon cross omega into r such that g t naught omega <coughs> equals i omega and d by d t of g t omega equals f of T G T omega see for, for the moment forget this W then what you are solving is you are looking for a G such as D G by D T equals F T F T G you are, sol you are solving the equation D by D T of G is F of T G forget omega. Omega is the param extra parameter which is thrown in. So, if a family of differential equations, so simultaneously an analytic solution for all of them. This is what the existence theorem for ordinary differential equations tells you. <coughs> and then the you can do this for every point t naught and in general you will be able to patch up the equation the entire interval a b provided you have uh, so, some suffix epsilon which covers everything. <coughs> anyway, so this is the it is a local theorem again ok. And of particular interest is the following statement. Let us assume that uh, 
special case the special case of interested in is <coughs> f of yeah you are given this function f of uh, omega equals u and i must also assume that i i omega equals omega and you are given this function g t u w <coughs> is actually going to be equal to g t u w is a a function r valued function so g sorry not, not g t u w g to g t omega which is same as u g t u are given this is function with values in hold on g t u one moment one moment i should be this more yeah i want to state make the statement for a system of equations so let me this should be rm i mean it's not just one equation but a system of equations so I put here i should yeah this into rm and then you have this is the statement is the same not just one you know the <coughs> so gtu yeah gtu is an element of rm so now this can be viewed oh, in my case it's uh, m is same as omega u are both in open sets in a fixed term so gtu is in rm now if you have this gtu in rm you can think of this if you like as so this is nothing but gi tu 1 less than 2 now look at this suppose you want u to u are the coordinates in the opens in the in rm then you can look at this gitu d by dui that is i am prescribing for every pair tu a tangent vector at the point gitu itself is a gitu itself is a point of rm and i am prescribing for every tu a tangent vector at gitu this can be thought of as tangent vector at g i now let me make a definition a vector field on an open set of r n open set Open set U of Rn is a, pre, is a prescription of uh, is an assignment to each point of Rn of a tangent vector. 
at that point, each point P of Rn, the tangent vector, a vector field that we give the name capital X, the tangent vector Xp at P. So that's the definition of vector field. Every point you are given a tangent vector. For example, if you look at d by dx, take R2, at every point you can take d by, dx, d by dx or d by dy, at every point you get a tangent vector. This is, this is the vector field d by dx. At every point P, you take d by dx. And similarly, this, if you look at this vector, you are going to get d by dy here with the coordinates at x, y. Let me also give another example. Let us look at the vector field x d by dx plus y d by dy. So at every point, if you take a point x, y, at this point the tangent vector is x d by dx plus y d by dy. It will be some kind of slanted thing, that is the way it looks. And at, or, at origin the vector, tangent vector is 0 because x is 0, y is 0, so at origin is 0. And along the uh, <coughs> x axis for instance, if you go like this, y is always 0. So this will disappear, it is always along the x axis, but as, it, as you near 0, the vector magnitude becomes less and less as you approach 0. Similarly, in the y axis, it is always along the y, the vector, tangent vector is all, always along the y axis, but as you, as you approach 0, the magnitude of the vector shrinks to 0. So these are examples of vector fields. Okay, now, what I want to say is the following. This, in this special case, so what you find is that <coughs> hold on, uh, d g i by d u is okay. So what I want to say is the following: following thing is true. Suppose the special the special case I'm looking at, if x is a vector field. Suppose that X is a vector field on open set U in Rn. Then you are given that, then given any compact set, analytic vector field. Analytic means in the right test, sigma f i d by d x i where f i are functions, all the f i should be analytic. That is the condition. So, suppose the x is a vector field on an open set u in R, then there is, uh, if k in u is any relatively compact open set. In Rn, in U, so that so that's an open set whose closure is compact and is contained in U. Suppose you have such a <coughs> there exists delta greater than zero and an analytic map phi t or rather phi from mod t less than delta. Instead of the interval a, b, I am going to take uh, some interval around the origin. So, phi t delta cross k into u satisfying the following conditions. One phi of zero x equals x for every x in k. Secondly, phi of 
t plus t prime x equals phi of t x <coughs> sorry phi, phi of t of phi of t prime x phi of t plus t prime x is same thing as applying phi t prime first on x and then on the resultant uh, element of Rn apply phi t. This is true provided if t plus t prime t t prime all have modulus less than delta so that these things are defined and phi t prime x in k. Notice that I am assuming that k is any op relatively, relatively compact open set and since phi 0 x is x for uh, t near 0 phi t x will continue to be inside k, k is open. So for t sufficiently close this will be true and so phi t prime x being in k is an acceptable condition for all t prime small it is automatically true. <coughs> so the, and thirdly for any f defined at phi t x x f at phi t x is d by d t of f composed with phi t x or rather f of phi t. Maybe the last line is not so visible. Huh? The last line seems not so visible. Last line. Phi t plus t prime x it's equals. It's not so visible uh, on the board. Maybe you want to erase and rewrite. You want me to. Yeah, I think the last two lines are not so visible. Okay, okay. Well. So the con I will write down the three conditions. The first condition is that phi 0 x equals x. Second B phi of t plus t prime the x is same as phi of t of phi of t prime x provided if mod t mod t prime mod t plus t prime are all less than delta and phi t prime x is in k. This for x in k because our phi t is defined only, only on k. So phi t you want the condition that if mod t mod t prime mod t plus t prime is less than delta and if phi t prime x is in k then this equality holds. Notice that this condition is kind of necessary to be able to define this as well as that. <coughs> Only if t prime is such that phi t prime x is in k and mod t is less than delta is the right hand side defined and for defining phi t prime x you need mod t prime to be less than delta. So this condition and this is the third condition is in some sense crucial it is that for every f defined in the neighborhood of phi t x d by x f let me uh, not said what x f is yeah let me since I have not defined x yeah d by d t of f of phi t x <coughs> as I vary t this is going to be in the neighborhood of phi t x and I look at this this must be equal to I am 
I am given a vector field x, this must be equal to x at phi t, x is a vector field. So at every point it defines a tangent vector, x of phi t x is a tangent vector, this applied to f. What this does is the following, phi t if you fix an x, phi t x describes a curve. If I fix an x and vary t, so it passes through x, phi t x is a curve through x at t equals 0, you get x and you get some curve like this. And <coughs> differentiating along this curve is same as at the point, if you want to take the point x and you got another point is phi t x is going to phi t you get another point there and differentiating along this curve at that point is same thing as differentiating the function with respect to the tangent vector x phi t x. For example, let us see what happens in special cases. If x equals d by dx, the vector field, you are given a vector field, d by dx a vector field. Then what is the thing? The so let us take the, the, the phi t of a pair, so x is d by dx phi t of a point x y in R2, I am looking at uh, in R2, it is nothing but phi of, you, you got the element of R2 here, so this is nothing but x plus t comma y. If you look at this vector field d by dx, the phi t you want the phi t x which you get is nothing but this. This phi t x is called the one parameter group associated to the vector field x. Notice that you have this prop, the local one parameter group, you have this property phi t plus t prime is phi t, phi t prime. If, you write, if I write phi sub t of x to be equal to phi t x, then you can think of phi t as a mapping of open set in Rn to Rn. defined for t less than delta. For a moment if you think of, uh, suppose t is defined for all real numbers, then what this says is that the mapping t going to phi t is a group homomorphism from the real line into the group of analytic automorphisms of Euclidean space. But you cannot expect it to be defined for all values, you can only say it is defined for small values of t. And whenever phi t composed with phi t prime, wherever it is defined is going to be equal to phi t plus t prime. That is what this is. This is called this phi t x equal to phi t x is the local one parameter group of local analytic diffeomorphisms. An analytic diffeomorphism means an analytic map which admits an inverse which is also analytic. So this is for each t you get an analytic diffeomorphism of an open set in Euclidean space onto another open set in Euclidean space. As t varies, it is as if it is a group of diffeomorphisms, not quite, it is only local, you cannot say it can't happen globally. For instance, if you take the vector field d by dx, but you only look at the domain, the disk, then phi t is not defined for all. If you want to stay within the disk, phi t is not defined for all t. If you take a small portion, it will only, you can't go beyond that part for d by dx. You can't go beyond there. It won't be defined beyond that. So this is called the local one parameter group of local diffeomorphisms. <coughs> and Slightly, sorry, the left hand side the t is a kind of variable, and the right hand side the t is a fixed real number. Right sorry, the left hand side you are differentiating with respect to a variable t at the point tx is what it means. Differentiating at the, see when you write dy by dx at d of by dx at x at the point x, so I am doing it at the point tx. T equals t. Then, 
for every t if you like if I put a t naught in it is a t naught here also I mean I, I can actually this is equivalent to saying d by dt at t equals 0 is x phi x x x at f I can it is completely equivalent. So this is equivalent to stating the same statement in, in the light of the second condition you find that this is same thing equivalent to saying d by dt of f of phi t x at t equal to 0 is x f at x. or rather x x at f. It is completely the two things are equivalent because I mean the, these two statements are equivalent in the light of 2. When you shift t prime it makes no difference shift by t prime. Okay, so this is a very important result which we in the, in the context of the groups is a very important result. For a vector field in any what it means is this a vector field means that at every point you are given a tangent vector you get a that is how you get a vector field and what this says is fix a point p and then you can find a curve which is tangential through that point you can find a curve which is tangential to the to, to which wherever it passes whichever point it passes through it is tangential to the vector field at that point that curve has a tangent vector that must coincide with the given vector tangent vector at that point. So this is one curve if you start with the point x another point the curve may like go like this or whatever. So given number of directions at various points you can find integral curves curves which are for which these vectors are tangent vectors that is what that is what the theorem says. Okay, I mean physically if you think of say, say fluid flow or something at every point there is a direction in which the, the fluid is flowing and that gives you a vector field. Okay. And if you follow the path of each particle that is when you get the integral curves which are the orbits under the one parameter group phi t that is what is happening here. So, these are the two important theorems for about analytic manifolds. Of course, these are also valid in the case of uh, k times differential manifolds and so on. I mean, k greater than or equal to one, you can make all these statements, many different statements. Except the corresponding, if you start with a, when you start with a differential equation, the solution. Will, if you start with something, you, if you start with c k, the solution will be c k, and no, no more. And that that that's the kind of thing that will happen. <coughs> Okay, so these are the this th this theorem has a complete similar analog on the on manifolds. If M is a manifold and K is a so instead of this, suppose that X is the analytic vector field on open set U in a manifold M. Then if K is new is any relatively compact open subset of U, there exists delta greater than zero with all these statements. Same statement goes through verbatim identically there is no problem. So on any compact set you can do that. Suppose the manifold itself is compact and the vector field is defined on the whole manifold then you get a phi t will be defined for every t because first it is defined so on a compact set it is defined for some mod t less than delta. Now take any t you it can always any t can be written as some n delta by 2 plus something which is between minus delta and plus delta it is between uh, sorry something between 0 and delta by 2 you can always write it like that and then you write so it is n delta so any t will be n delta plus some alpha where 0 less than to alpha where 0 less than to alpha strictly less than delta by 2. Okay. You can write any t uniquely like this and then you define phi t as phi delta by 2 power n that is composed with itself n times composed with phi alpha. 
So, phi t will be defined for all t in the real line and the formula phi t plus t prime equals phi of t phi t composed with phi t prime will hold in general. So, yeah, uh, sorry, I should. So, so, on a compact manifold, if x is a vector field on a compact manifold, then there exists phi from r cross m to m such that phi t plus t prime yeah so phi 0 m equals m that is the identity map and phi t plus t prime m is phi t phi t prime m and d by dt of f composed with phi t at t equal to 0 equals x at the point x x the vector field at the point x applied to f. There are some other situation or situations also where the vector field may be defined for all, I mean the one parameter group may be defined for all t. We will come across that at some point, we will talk about that in that. So, these are the two most important theorems from uh, theory of analytic manifolds that we need, okay. Uh, we will need in the sequel. I am afraid uh, since many of you are not familiar with these concepts, I have to go through that before I can get to compactly groups proper. So, maybe, uh, yeah, I, th I think I will have to stop here, it is already 5.30. So, next lecture again, I will continue to uh, talk about Lie groups and it is only after that I will uh, pin, uh, I will come down to compact Lie groups and more detailed study of them. So, next time I will state the three important theorems of Lie theory basic theorems of Lie theory. Uh, well, the theorem uh, at this point I cannot, uh, okay, I, 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 one theorem that can be stated immediately is the following theorem is that a closed subgroup of a Lie group is a Lie group. That is I am assuming, all that I am assuming it is a subgroup which is closed on the, in the topology, then automatically it has an analytic structure which makes it into a Lie group. It becomes an analytic manifold, makes it into a Lie group. It is what is known as called an analytic submanifold. This theorem is due to Cartan. In fact, Lie theory, the most important theorems are due to two people. One is Lie, the other is Cartan. Uh, <coughs> This is, a, this is one theorem and there is the notion of a Lie algebra of a Lie group. Well, I am already most of my time, I will stop here. So, next time I will define the Lie algebra of a Lie group and once I have the definition of a Lie algebra, then there is what is called the fundamental theorem of Lie theory, which essentially tells you that there is a correspondence between Lie, Lie groups and Lie algebras, which converts problems about Lie groups into problems about Lie algebras. And problems of Lie algebras are in some sense easier to handle. The algebra is easier to handle than the analytic manifold the analysis. All the analysis that you do is transformed into algebra and then you can talk about what happens with the Lie algebras. So, that is uh, next time I will talk about the correspondence between the groups and Lie algebras. Okay, I have to stop here. I do not know if. Uh, <coughs> okay. Any questions? Yeah. There is no question, but what is asking for reference? Sorry? Which book to follow? Oh, oh okay. Uh, maybe 
Deep and will be able to help. Which see, I am not familiar with later books. I I know Chevalier's book, no, Theory of League Groups. I think it's still classic. It's a classic, but it's not easy to read. Tom Dick, is it? Yeah. There's one by Watsushima on Lee Groups. Yeah, and Tom Dick. Yeah, I think this is very good. Yeah, I think you are the right guy. The no, most. Suggested just now is very yeah, yeah. Tom Dick. Tom and Tom Dick. That's one name. And then the other thing, did you mention some other name? Sorry? My hearing is not so good. Krusterman, is it? Who? What's what's the name? I'm sorry, my hearing is not. Dustamat. Okay, okay. Is there a double T? Maybe two double T. Right? Yeah, the, the title will have the groups in it. I, I, I'm not sure of the. Right. Of course, the classic is the class, classic is Chevrolet. Yeah. Is in some, I mean, it's the first textbook, graduate textbook to appear. Theory of Lee groups, it's called, and it's a tough book. The definition of analytic manifolds itself is already. It's it is uh, in some sense the correct definition. The definition I made is, is also correct, but you know the, the more canonical right way of doing it is uh, what the Chevalier does. But that in the first instance puts you off. It's not easy to <coughs> understand what's going on there. But once you get familiar with uh, the groups, with, uh, with analytic manifolds, and then go back to Chevalier and read, then you understand his definition as the right definition, so to speak. That's. Uh, well, the, the, for analytic manifolds itself, uh, well, uh, one uh, for manifolds, there is the lecture notes of Raghavan Narsimhan, Tata and Shoot lecture notes of R. Narsimhan, which is very good. for dealing with uh, analytic manifolds as well. It's a, a book which covers a lot of material which you do not find. It's called, the Tata's lecture notes is called uh, Topics and Analysis. And you find uh, theorems there which are usually not found in many analysis books. For instance, uh, there is a beautiful theorem of uh, Whitney. Many of you will know with the Weierstrass approximation theorem, which tells you that any continuous function on an open set in Euclidean space can be approximated by a polynomial uniformly on compact sets. Now, the, 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 there's a the theorem of Whitney, which tells you that given any so omega open in R n and Suppose you are given eta is a function to a continuous function of into r plus. Suppose you are given that, then for every continuous f on omega, there exists and yeah, there exists. Analytic G on Omega such that G minus F in G X minus F X in modulus is less than eta X. For example, the function eta can decay to zero near the boundary. And then the approximation becomes better and better at the boundary. The function is analytic, but it approximates the given function continuous function f to within eta. Eta can decrease to 0 towards the boundary. And the approximation is better and better as you go towards the boundary. So, if you 
It's a remarkable theorem due to Whitney. Yes, yes. I mean, no. Uh, the point is, yeah, yeah. If we have G is analytic, the point is the main point is G is analytic, and the if you want, you can as I say, if you have this k time differentiable, you can take the up to k derivatives, you will have the same inequality. D k f x minus D k D k g x minus D k f x will be less than eta x. Any, con any continuous function for p everywhere positive. So, for instance, if, the, if I have this on the real line, for instance, you can, you can have a function, suppose this is the domain, you can have a function like this, which tapers off to 0. And the approximation of the fun given function f is much better here than here. It gets better and better as you approach the boundary. And uh, this omega can be whole of Rn. You know, if you have given a continuous function of whole of Rn, you can approximate it by means of analytic function as closely as you want to within any function eta. Eta can be constant also. Sorry? Eta can be constant also. Eta constant then is real. I mean, the point is that you can make it taper off to 0 and still the approximation holds. The approximation become, becomes better and better as you go to infinity. Seems it's. Uh, it's not a, it's not an easy theorem to prove. It's, but uh, this is one book where you'll find a proof of this. I don't know of any other book on analysis where you'll find a proof of this statement, for example. And there is another statement which is, uh, for example, this is a theorem due to Emil Borel. It's about C infinity functions. Suppose you are given uh, any sequence, say a n, then you can construct a C infinity function with a n as the nth derivative of the function. On, on the whole of R you can construct a C infinity function at one point with a n as the nth derivative at 0. So, you can prescribe the derivatives arbitrarily which shows that uh, you can have C infinity functions through stainless series as no chance of converge. You can make the a n go to infinity for instance and still you, have, you can have uh, a function whose derivatives nth derivatives a n. That I mean, such theorems again you don't find in normal multi multivariate calculus books. But this one, this book has such theorems. Number of other theorems. Of course, it also goes into something about complex analytic manifolds in some detail. But there is enough about real analytic functions which is interesting there. He also defines manifolds and uh, makes some statements about manifolds and so on. There is uh, if you see if you. There is a big difference between C infinity and analytic in, in, some, in some sense, in the sense that uh, this seems to suggest there is no big difference, the Whitney theorem, but the, the, the difference lies in the fact that very many proofs, <coughs> there are statements which are true both for a C infinity and analytic. You can make corresponding statements which are true, <coughs> but in the analytic case, they are much more difficult to prove. For instance, there is a famous the Whitney embedding theorem, <coughs> which tells you any manifold can be embedded in R to n plus 1, C infinity embedding. The statement is true for any analytic manifold also. You can have an analytic embedding, but a lot more difficult to prove. This is uh, actually essentially due to Grauert. Grauert proved that if you have a <coughs> relatic manifold, it can be realized as the real part of a Stein manifold, of a Stein manifold, the real part. And Stein manifold <coughs> you can embed. <coughs> actually, and that is that's a proof that Grauert gave. And Raghavanasan pointed out for a Stein manifold, real analytic embedding is trivial because global co coordinates are, I mean, global functions give local coordinates. So, from that, the only thing is to have a proper function, and getting a proper real analytic function is easy. In into C, some C and you want a proper function. Anyway, Raghavanasan pointed out that getting a real analytic function is easy. So, real analytic embedding, you have to know something about Stein manifolds, but you know, you know, you know, have to know that it has a neighborhood which is time, but that's all. It's uh, then real embedding is easy. <coughs>